Hello again, everyone. Today we're going to be focusing on the human brain, the three pound jello like consistency mass atop your shoulders with 85 billion neurons. As we work through lecture today, you're going to want to fill in the brain regions table on worksheet 1.3. Um, there's columns for function and location. So fill that in and then in the following lecture we actually have a activity planned where we'll look at the communication that occurs between different brain regions to carry out specific tasks. All right, science memes for today. Well, actually only one science brain related meme and then one just kind of student life type meme. So that one says you're emailing your instructor, uh, you're using polite greeting, multiple paragraphs, perfect grammar, and your teacher, sure, sent from iPhone. Definitely guilty of that. Uh, don't take any offense. I'm usually just kind of running around. Brain on a test and brain while trying to sleep. Isn't that true? Um, by the end of actually the next lecture, though, you will know the brain regions that are associated with sleep. So keep that in mind. Today we're going to have a more in-depth look at the components of the brain. So we'll start with the cerebral cortex, including its four lobes, where we'll talk about motor and somatosensory cortices, we'll talk about language and association areas. Then we'll move to the basal nuclei, okay. maybe you remember that uh, nuclei are a clustering, clustering of cell bodies within the brain. Then we'll move to the diencephalon, including the thalamus and the hypothalamus. And we'll finish up with the brainstem and the cerebellum. Now, earlier organisms had very primitive nervous systems, uh, meaning that they had very few interneurons. So remember that interneurons are uh, entirely within the CNS, and so we're kind of this integration of information from afferent and efferent uh, comes together. So we can see here if we look further left on this. We have this simple organism here. This is going to have mostly afferent and efferent neurons, not very many inner neurons. You'll also notice, well, it's not shown perfectly here, but um, a, a lot of those inner neurons are going to be located just kind of without the body. But during evolutionary development, that inner neural component expands, and you can see it moves rostrally towards the head toward the head of the organism. We're adding new sophisticated layers here of interneurons on top of older layers. And these are gonna do, uh, have more specialized purposes. And at the end, we're gonna have the, kind of this, what we call the brain, this mass collection of interneurons located at the head end or rostrally of the organism. Now we'll review the components of the brain. And the way we have these listed here, um, we're going to go from the bottom, starting with the brainstem, up to the cerebral cortex. And that actually corresponds to the most basic functions to the most specialized functions as we move from bottom to top. So let's start with the brainstem, um, that area down in the bottom in brown. That includes the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And this is the oldest region and is responsible for more life-sustaining processes, including things like breathing, circulation, digestion. We'll talk about these shortly. Above that, the pink region, we have the cerebellum. This is involved in proper positioning of the body. Atop that, we have the diencephalon, which is not indicated here, but I'll highlight it for you. It includes structures such as the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Hypothalamus involved with maintaining homeostasis and thalamus involved in sensory processing. Atop that, we have the cerebrum. It sits atop the lower brain region. So you can picture it kind of like a scoop of ice cream atop a cone. If the cone is those bottom brain regions. It makes up about 80% of the total brain within humans. It's really what we call convoluted. It has these gyri, these folds that allow us to increase surface area. And the outermost layer is the cortex. And then the inner layer includes things like the basal nuclei. As a general rule with the brain, as we move from caudal to rostral, caudal meaning tail, rostral, uh, rostrum, which is front, we see that there's more complex function 
and it's more evolutionarily advanced, that frontal area. It involves things like our problem-solving capabilities, our planning abilities, as well as our ability to inhibit impulses, especially within that uh, frontal lobe. Also includes things like working memory. Now, our lower animals, as we've seen, they lack that rostral complexity, and they rely more on those lower brain centers. The last thing I would point out are all the, the squiggles there atop the brain. These are called the gyri, and it's this highly folded area. If we compare a mouse brain to a human brain, you see that the gyri, or those folds, are far less pronounced on the mouse brain. The cortex tends to be smoother in ancestral animals. The human brain kind of looks like a walnut if you were to crack it open. And those folds or gyri increase the surface area and allows packing in of much more neural circuitry. In fact, the human brain, there's a three times surface area increase compared to if that human brain would to be a smooth surface. Okay? The cortex there is the most complex integration area of the brain. It's involved in voluntary movement, interpretation of your surroundings, conscious thought, and even language. If you could unfold or uncoil your brain, which you can't, that's a physical impossibility, but if you could unravel all of this, it would equal about two square feet, which is mind blowing to me because all of that, just when it's coiled together, becomes this three-ish pound organ that fits into your skull. So now let's talk a little bit more about the cerebral cortex, including its four lobes. Cerebral cortex is divided into right and left hemispheres. Uh, and recall that the cortex is the outer shell made up of gray matter that covers an inner core of white matter. That gray matter, that's that densely packed neuron cell bodies and those dendrites. And we can think of this as the computational centers or computers of the CNS. Okay? Then beneath that, we have the white matter. You can think of these as the wires that connect those computers, and we call these tracks. So these fiber tracks in the white matter transmit signals from one part of the cortex to another. Different areas of the cortex are communicating with another allows for simple tasks like taking a bite of food. So seemingly simple, but in reality it's not. That involves uh, vision in one part of the cortex that needs to communicate with smell in another, and then initiating that movement in yet another. And we're going to practice this concept later. Now, the white matter that consists of these axons, or the tracts of these neurons, um, they're kind of like the information superhighways within the CNS. If you were to line those up end to end, they stretch a quarter of a million miles. That's how many million miles of fibers we have, a quarter million. Um, that's about the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So picture that. There are four lobes of the cerebral cortex, and they're kind of split up by these deep folds within the cortex that divide it into those four major lobes called the sulci, or singular is going to be the sulcus. So first off, we're going to start with the occipital lobe at the very back. And the occipital lobe is what houses the visual cortex, your visual processing centers. And we'll talk about these more in depth when we actually talk about uh, sensory vision exclusively. Today, I want to talk about the occipital lobe of the brain. So the occipital lobe is located in the back of your head. So this would be the front, this is the back. Now this is pretty cool. You can see these blood vessels on the superficial part of the brain. And then this is the cerebellum down here. But the occipital lobe's job is to process visual impulses. So my fingers and the brain and the phone you're holding in your hand are all in the back of your head right now. Next up, of the remaining three lobes, we have the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe houses the auditory cortex. Um, temporal, just named for the location, it's near the temples there. Following that, we have the parietal lobe. Parietal actually means wall, so you can picture it as a wall between your occipital lobe and the frontal lobe. And the parietal lobes are responsible for reception and perception of somatosensory input. So here we have, a, just to indicate that we have a hand that is touching an area. Finally, we have the frontal lobes, and these are responsible for voluntary motor movement, 
as well as higher functions such as speaking and just general thought. Now right behind the frontal lobe we just finished talking about is the central sulcus. Remember a sulcus is a deep groove and these sulci are what separate the different lobes that we've been talking about. And the central sulcus, named for its central location, divides the frontal and parietal lobes. So I'll indicate that here with an arrow. Um, in front of the sulcus is what is called the primary motor cortex. And it lies within the precentral gyrus, that purplish bluish area they're showing. So remember a gyrus is a fold, and this is in front of that central sulcus, hence the name precentral gyrus. So your primary motor cortex is found within that precentral gyrus. Now posterior to the groove is the somatosensory cortex. Soma meaning body and then sensory, so body sensory, things like touch. And this is found behind that central gyrus. So that somatosensory cortex is found within the postcentral gyrus, that kind of orangish creamish area behind the central sulcus there. For a little more in-depth look at the parietal lobes here, we see that the parietal lobes accomplish somatosensory processing. So that just means that sensations from the surface of the body, such as pain, touch, pressure, sensations of temperature, hot and cold, um, they're detected by sensory receptors within the skin. They're then relayed along these afferent fibers to the CNS. That's afferent arriving information to the CNS and then projected or sent to the somatosensory cortex within that parietal lobe. Now, look at this image here. Notice that the pain, in this case, we got a tap going into the skin, enters on the right side of the body. It then crosses over or desiccates and then is processed on the left side within the somatosensory cortex. So the brain mostly receives sensory input from the opposite side of the body. Now there is a little pit stop around the way. The simple awareness of pain or touch, hot, cold, is actually first going to be detected by the thalamus. That's that orangish area there within that brain cross section. But the details about that pain or touch how severe, etc., are going to be determined by the cortex. Finally, each region of the somatosensory cortex gets input from specific areas of the body. So to kind of elaborate on this point, I want to talk to you about the homunculus. Homunculus means little man. And the concept of the homunculus is that the size of each body part on that little man indicates the proportion or amount of cortex dedicated to that area. So we see right off the bat here that this little man has really large hands, a really big tongue, giant lips, larger genitalia. And if you think about sensation, think about your hands, for example, fingertips. People um, that are sight impaired have to be able to distinguish between, you know, little bumps that are between one to three millimeters apart when reading braille. So it's going to be important that we have a larger part of the somatosaur sensory cortex dedicated so we can distinguish those fine points via sensory capabilities. Now we'll switch from the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobes to the primary motor cortex located within the frontal lobes. And these control skeletal muscles. And this is that precentral gyrus that we talked about before. Now, <clears throat> the stimulation of different areas of the primary cortex, motor cortex, bring about movement in different regions of the body. So stimulation in one area may cause you to lift a finger, while stimulation in another may cause you to lift your knee, for example. And just like with sensory, the motor cortex on one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So, for example, you'll see damage to motor control on the left side of the brain will produce paralysis on the right side of the body. So revisiting the concept of the homunculus here, um, we've separated the somatosensory cortex, or that postcentral gyrus shown in blue, and the precentral gyrus, or the motor cortex. And so we've dedicated a certain amount of cortex to that body part. We've divided it here by sensory, 
versus motor. So if we look over at the motor here, located within that pre-central uh, gyrus, we'll see we got um, large lips and tongue. These are large, and that allows for fine motor control needed through things like speech. You can see other things are small, like the arm. Not much brain tissue is devoted for non-complex movements. Notice there is also a premotor cortex, and that's located right in front of the primary motor cortex. The premotor cortex helps with things like orientation of the body towards a specific target, and that's going to be based on input from your sensory association areas. So premotor mortex is going to associate with those sensory areas. Um, for example, maybe you see something and you want to tur turn your body toward it. Maybe you hear something, you want to move toward it. It's going to help with body orientation. It also helps with contributing to plan a program to be sent to the primary motor cortex. Think of it as like kind of a set of directions that the primary motor cortex can follow to carry out that command. And finally, it helps coordinate more skilled movements. Perhaps this is swinging a golf club accurately. The premotor cortex helps orient the body toward a target based on sensory input. So what if there's damage to the premotor cortex? Well, then you might not be able to process sensory information properly in order to complete a purposeful movement, such as using utensils. Let's look at an individual with this disorder that we call apraxia. Right hand. Okay. <laughs> Salute like a soldier. Perfect. I think you could be in the army. I don't think so. <laughs> How would you signal traffic to stop with your right hand? I don't know. I doubt would do it. But that's the one you have trouble with. You okay. Don't, no. But say say stop. With your right hand. Not sure. How would you do it? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, let's go on to the next one. That's fine. How would you blow a kiss to your daughter with your right hand? <laughs> You're blowing a kiss. Okay. How would you signal quiet with your right hand if you wanted to help people to be quiet? Now let's investigate the regions of the brain associated with language. Language abilities are only found in the left hemispheres. That's why we just have this left hemisphere view here. Now, language involves combining two capabilities. That's the expression of language, or speaking, and the comprehension of language, or understanding. Um, so Broca's area, I'll highlight it here, that's the area responsible for speaking ability. It's in your left part of the frontal lobe, and it plans a motor program for speech. So it helps create kind of a set of instructions that is sent to the motor area to allow you to form words. Next up, we have Wernicke's area. Um, Wernicke's area is involved with language comprehension. So this is both written and spoken. It's, uh, it's found where we have the juncture of the parietal and temporal lobes. Wernicke's area that is associated with comprehension also um, does this by using auditory and visual information. So Wernicke's area receives input from the visual cortex, for example, in the occipital lobe. And this is going to be useful when we're doing things with language such as reading or describing seen objects. We're also going to use information from the auditory cortex in the temporal lobe. And this is going to be important for understanding spoken words, that type of comprehension. Now, Wernicke's area also helps formulate coherent speech patterns. So this info is formulated in Wernicke's and then is transferred via fibers to Broca's area to control the actual act of speaking. Now, what happens if you get some type of brain damage to these language centers? Well, the loss ability to understand or express speech caused by brain damage is called an aphasia. So there's two aphasias. There's Broca's aphasia or motor aphasia and there's Wernicke's aphasia, or what we call fluent aphasia. So damage to Broca's area 
um, you're, you lose that ability to form words. You can't make that plan to send to the motor cortex to physically form words. But you can write okay, and you can understand others okay. It's, it's frustrating because you know what you want to say, but you physically can't. Now, on the flip side, you have Wernicke's aphasia, or what we call fluent aphasia. Uh, if you get damage to Wernicke's area, you can't understand. Remember, this is comprehension. You can't understand words that you see or hear. You can speak fluently. You have no problem with f for physically forming those words. That's Broca's area's job. But it's a string of missense words. So let's check out Broca's aphasia first. Okay. <clears throat> so what's your name? Um, Scott. Oh, no. Sarah Scott. That's right. And how old are you? I can't. Try. I can't. You're 19. 19. Compare that to Wernicke's aphasia, which again affects comprehension. So can't understand words they see or hear, but can string together um, fluently a string of jumbled, missense words. Hi, Byron. How are you? I'm happy. Are you pretty? You look good. What are you doing today? We stay with the water over here at the moment and talk with the people over them over there. They're diving for them at the moment. They'll save in the moment. He'll have water very soon for him. With luck for him. So we're on a cruise and we're about to We get will store it right here and they'll save their hands right there. The motor, sensory, and language areas we just talked about, they take up one half of the cerebral cortex. And the remainder of that cortex is dedicated to association areas, and these are related to higher function. When I say higher function, we're talking about our conscious mental activity, such as thinking, remembering, and the human ability to reason. Now, first we have the prefrontal association cortex. And this is just anterior to the premotor cortex, and this is associated with thinking or brainstorming. It allows us to weigh consequences of future actions. Okay, so this is pretty cool. In my hands, I'm holding the right hemisphere of a real human brain. Now, most of what you're looking at, see all this folded stuff? That's called the cerebrum. This thing down here is cerebellum. Now, the cerebrum is in charge of a lot of different things, but what I want to focus on is this part right here. This is called your frontal lobe or frontal cortex. Now, this, believe it or not, this whole area right there doesn't fully develop until you're 25 years old. And that's where your personality and a lot of your rational decision-making are located, or, well, lack thereof. So you may have heard of someone saying uh, you don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex yet. Um, the prefrontal cortex also carries out working memory, so it can temporarily hold bits of information for current mental task at hand. Okay. Additionally, we have two more association cortices we got to talk about. Uh, the first being the parietal, temporal, occipital association cortex. So it has those three names actually because it's found between those three areas. And it's found, it's located there because it's actually pooling and integrating somatic, auditory, and visual information from those different lobes. Uh, it enables you to get the big picture in a sense regarding your body position and the external world. So a good example of this would be when you're lying on your side and watching TV, 
um, because of this association cortex, you don't think the TV is also laying on its side. Finally, we have the limbic association cortex. This one will keep it simple. This is involved with motivation and emotion and has a large component in your memory. Now on your worksheet, um, you're just gonna put in some common characteristics of these association cortices. I don't really need you to know the specifics of all three of these. That's gonna bring us to basal nuclei, the clustering of cell bodies deep within the brain. Recall that the cortex is made up of gray matter. Well, there's also gray matter deep to the cortex concentrated in nuclei, um, this collection of cell bodies deep within the cerebral white matter. So it's kind of like those uh, collection of cell bodies in the PNS called ganglia. Um, in the CNS, nuclei are a functioning group of neuron cell bodies, and they help to initiate movement while suppressing useless or unwanted movements. They also help with monitoring and coordinating slow, sustained contractions. Maybe you're holding a bucket out in front of you. And they're also, uh, they help with inhibiting muscle tone throughout the body. Okay, you wouldn't want all muscles tensed up at any given time. Also found deep within the brain, right near those basal nuclei, is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is comprised of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Just going to show you another view, perhaps better view, of the diencephalon here, which again includes the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Hypo meaning below, so the hypothalamus is below the thalamus. I also need to point out that the diencephalon technically does include the epithalamus. Epi, that prefix meaning upon, so it's found upon the thalamus. Um, this contains the pineal gland, which releases melatonin, what we think of as that sleep-inducing chemical. Now, the thalamus, which I've highlighted here, is an important part of the brain because it acts as a sensory relay station. So it does preliminary processing of all incoming sensory input. In fact, all sensory input synapses in the thalamus on the way to the cortex. Um, in this manner, it kind of acts to filter out junk signals while sending important sensory information to the specific parts of the somatosensory cortex. So if we look at this cartoon here on the top right, you can see there's a base station. The base station, let's just say, is some sensory um, part of your body. That information that's gathered is going to be sent to the relay station, your thalamus. The thalamus is going to then relay those signals after processing to the correct areas of the somatosensory cortex. Now the hypothalamus is a collection of nuclei and those fibers that sits beneath the thalamus, hence hypo. It acts as an integration center for autonomic nervous system, that involuntary part of the nervous system. So it's the brain area that's involved in regulating the internal environment of the body. So in contrast to the thalamus, which act as a relay station for sensory information, this deals with um, autonomic processes. Um, these autonomic things include regulating homeostatic functions such as body temperature, our thirst desire, our urine output, our desire to eat, and hormonal output. So it serves as a major autonomic nervous system coordinating center. And because of that, it affects smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, exocrine glands, those things controlled by autonomic nervous system. It also does have a role in emotion and it participates in the sleep-wake cycle, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. All right, that brings us to brainstem. So let's talk about this thing right here called the brainstem. Now there are three different areas to it. We have the midbrain, we have the pons, and then we have the medulla oblongata, which is everybody's favorite. Now the medulla, it has several different functions, but one of them is to maintain your respiratory rate. So the fact is you don't have to consciously go breathe in, <gasps> breathe out, <sighs> breathe in, <gasps> breathe out. <sighs> and that's all thanks to the medulla oblongata. Okay, so we just learned that the brain stem includes the midbrain, the pons beneath that, and the medulla beneath 
that. Um, the brain stem in general just is a bunch of pathways for fiber tracts that run between higher and lower neural centers. Um, they also contain centers that control cardiovascular, respiratory, and digestive functions. So the general function is to produce autonomic involuntary behaviors that we need to survive. It's kind of like a survival center, those, those basic processes that need to occur. It also has a role in controlling the degree of cortical alertness, uh, the RAS, and we'll learn about that in the next lecture. Fans of the Adam Sandler movie, The Water Boy, will know that it is not due to an enlarged medulla oblongata that alligators are so aggressive. It's actually their ornery due to how much teeth they have crammed in their heads. Okay. I was just thinking about that movie the other day. But the medulla, as we learned in that TikTok, um, contains nuclei that control respiratory rate, also controls heart rate as well as blood vessel diameter. Okay, so I'll highlight that here at the base, highlight that respiratory center. The pons then works with the medulla to control respiration rate and depth. Well, how is this accomplished? Let's take a look. Inside of your aorta, which is the largest blood vessel in your body, which rests just above the heart, and then inside your carotid arteries here in the neck, which you can press on to feel your pulse, you have what are called chemoreceptors. These chemoreceptors monitor how much oxygen and carbon dioxide are essentially in the blood. And what's going to happen is they're going to send a signal to your brainstem, which is all the way back here. And inside of the brainstem, you have, well, there's three areas, but two of them are important for breathing. The two that are important are called the pons and the medulla oblongata. Inside of of those two subregions, we pretty much just call it the respiratory center. And the respiratory center is what's in charge of breathing. It then sends signals to your respiratory muscles, like your intercostals and your diaphragm, telling them to breathe. So it's pretty much just reflexive based on oxygen levels. The user Ali Brenner 1 nailed it. Awesome job. And the last component of the brain we'll talk about today is the cerebellum. So it sits directly underneath the cortex's occipital lobe. And it's this strange, it's highly folded. It looks like a mini brain almost. It's a baseball size part. And it's pretty cool actually. If you were to look inside of the cerebellum, there's this tree-like structure, or it appears to be. And that's this collection of white matter, or the axons, um, called the arbor vitae, which translates to tree of life because that is how it appears. Um, the cerebellum is importantly involved in balance as well as planning and executing your voluntary movements. So it also helps smooth voluntary muscle control and then importantly it encodes procedural memory. So what I mean by that is your muscle memory. It's motor skill that's gained through repetition. So for example swinging a golf club. I golfed for man the first time in 11 years the other day and my swing was still pretty much there due to this encoding of procedural memory that occurs within the cerebellum. So what I want to focus on today is this area of the central nervous system called the cerebellum. Now, the cerebellum's job, besides looking really cool, is to smooth your muscle movement. So let's say I wanted to wiggle my fingers. That decision would begin up in this area called the motor cortex. Now what would happen is these two structures would communicate with one another to make that movement nice and smooth. Without the cerebellum, I could still move my fingers, but it would be far more disjointed and sloppy. Okay, you made it. The takeaway for today, the parts of the brain from lowest being most primitive to the highest or most sophisticated are the brainstem, then the cerebellum, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the basal nuclei, and then the cerebral cortex, which is gigantic within us humans. That cerebral cortex, its outer shell is made of gray matter, which are the neuron cell bodies and the dendrites, as well as the glial cells, didn't mention that earlier. And they sit atop a core of white matter, which are those myelinated axons or fibers. Functions are localized to different regions of the um, cortex. So you have the occipital lobe, which contains the visual cortex, the temporal lobe, which contains the auditory cortex. We have the parietal lobe responsible for somatosensory 
and then the frontal, which is responsible for voluntary motor control. We have different language areas, and they include Broca's area and Wernicke's area. We also talked individually about the association areas, but in general, they kind of provide this integrative link between the sensory information and purposeful action. The basal nuclei help initiate movement and coordinate slow contractions. The thalamus, that acts as a relay station for preliminary processing of sensory input. Sensory input's gotta pass through the thalamus. Then the hypothalamus on the flip side helps regulate many homeostatic functions uh, associated with the autonomic nervous system. The brain stem acts as a link between the spinal cord and the higher brain levels. It also contains centers for cardio, respiratory, and digestive function. And finally, the cerebellum helps us maintain balance while coordinating voluntary movement while also storing procedural memories. That's it. Uh, take care. We'll see you next time.